I am so excited to introduce our speaker for today, actually um, one of our colleagues at the museum. It is Dr. Rachel Smith, uh, the head of astronomy and astrophysics lab, research lab, and curator of our meteorites collection at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Dr. Smith is also an associate professor at Appalachian State University and an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And Dr. Smith is also a very important part of Astronomy Days. So um, Rachel, thank you so much for being here and sharing your expertise with us. And go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. Yeah. Um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's been a really fun week of astronomy. And I'm gonna share my screen now. So hopefully you all can see. So thank you. Um, I'm excited to present today using a software called OpenSpace. And here is, uh, we're looking at the solar system. And what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna take you on a little tour of our solar system, um, focusing on the terrestrial planets and the rocky bodies in our solar system. Um, so we're gonna skip a couple of planets. Probably some of you might be disappointed um, if we, we wanted to see Jupiter or even Saturn, like I mentioned, because these are not rocky bodies. And we're going to talk about the rocky bodies in our solar system today. So first of all, this is um, just looking down at our solar system. These are called orbital trails. And this is where our terrestrial planets are uh, orbiting the sun, which is here in the center. And you might see, you can play, I just want to mention too, that the software I'm using, this is a live tour. Um, this is not a video recording. This is um, our Milky Way and a star field, all accurately placed. This is a project that's um, NASA funded through our partnership with the American Museum of Natural History in New York and some other partners um, as well, some museum partners, and it's led by the American Museum of Natural History. Um, so the funding for this project goes to creating programs and um, really cool content, we think, and getting the software usable for everybody to use. So you can use it, it's free to download. And I think that um, the link to open space will be in the chat. Um, so I'm going to take you on this tour of open space. Everything is real data. So it's thinking about how do scientists visualize data? How do we see places we can never go to ourselves? So we're going to go to some places we have been to. First of all, we've been to Earth. We're on Earth. Most of us are, in any case, um, are on Earth. And we've also landed on the moon. Uh, we've sent rovers to Mars. And so these are worlds that we've been to and we have really great imagery of. But then there are places that we haven't been. And, and for example, all these stars that you see and even these outer planets. And so we, so thinking about how do scientists visualize data and just thinking um, just in your minds, you know, everything we see is a way to visualize space and places we can't go. And even with open space, which I don't have time to show you all of this today, but you can go to the end of the visible universe, which is the cosmic microwave background. And that's also real data. But of course, that's so far away that we have not even remotely closely gotten that far. We can't even really get to Mars, in fact, safely yet. So anyway, so this is our solar system. And here you can see, if you, if you move it, you can see it's a very thin plane. All the planets orbit along around the sun in about the same plane. They're not really above and below. They're all that look, they all orbit in what looks like a disk. And I'm going to supplement some of this um, presentation with some pictures. And the first one is a um, rendering of a protoplanetary disk. So our solar system formed from a disk that looks that is similar to this. This is again an artistic rendering based on real data, where you have a star forming in the center, could be multiple stars as well, and you have a disk of gas and dust around it. And these take about a million or so years to form into planets. And here's a little. A uh, rocky body here that might be a planet starting to form that the artist put in, which is all realistic. We have these stars forming all the time in our uh, solar system and in our galaxy. I'm sorry, not in our solar system, pardon me. In our galaxy, we only have one star in our solar system, which is the sun, which is well along its way in its, uh, in its midlife right now. In our galaxy, and almost every star has a planet, we think. And so when we think about what could be beyond Earth, we certainly can um, probably easily open our minds to the idea of life beyond our planet. And yet we're still looking for evidence of that life, but it could be there because there's so many stars and so many planets. 
So the research I do, which I'm not going to talk about too much today is, or really at all, in fact, is looking at the gas in this phase. So before planets form to understand the chemistry that goes into planet formation. But I just want to mention that when we study these protoplanetary disks and all of the stuff that goes into forming planets, um, we are actually also learning about our own solar system and how it formed billions of years ago, about 4.6 billion years ago. And again, these stars are forming now, so they're analogs to our formation. And another thing that's cool about this is that we have remnants of our formation. And so I'll turn this off. And the remnants, when I turn on this menu, I'm gonna turn on some data sets. So the remnants of our formation are, there are two, well, there are many, but the repositories we often think about are the asteroids and the comets. And so I'm gonna turn on some comets and I made a list of some examples. So we have comets, we have Halley type comets, which is, Come, um, uh, Halley's Comet, which, or, which comes around every 76 years. Uh, that's uh, one of the Halley type comets. And these are all data sets that um, are put into open space based on their orbits and Jupiter family comets. So these are just a few comets. The length of these trails have to do with how far out they go, but I'm not zooming in very far now. This is the orbit of Neptune here, this blue line right here. I'm not zooming out very far because these are the outer parts of the disk. These are the icy bodies, they're mostly made of ice. And when they come into our solar system, we see them as they get heated up, we see their beautiful tails, which are basically the ice coming off as gas. And um, we have some images of comets that have come through and we'll look at those in a second. But, um, but these outer comets uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune is the Kuiper belt. Uh, and that, uh, we don't really have a data set for that now in open space, but that's where Pluto resides, right? So. Pluto has been demoted into a dwarf planet or a Kuiper belt object, which is um, really okay, honestly, it's still out there. Nothing's really happened to it. It's just not actually a planet. And I know that's a sensitive topic for some people, so we won't discuss it in this talk. <laughs> but anyway, um, so these are the icy bodies and they're really cool. And I'll just mention that uh, some of the most interesting ones, I think, oh, I, was, I wanted to actually turn on an orbit here it, the nice thing about open space is now we have two orbital trails. I'm going to turn these on and actually to see them, I'm going to turn off some of these. But and, and if you, yes, go oh, ahead. We had a question real yeah. quick. Um, how does Halley's Comet keep coming back? Is it in orbit of some kind? Maybe what is it? Yeah, it's, it's actually in what now it's in a stable orbit that keeps coming back around the sun. And so it hasn't been totally, we say sublimated because basically the ice becomes vapor as it heats up. So Halley's Comet is big enough that it can survive coming close to the sun and, um, and, uh, and getting heated and some of that ice coming off, but then, then it goes back out into the outer solar system and comes back around. So it is a big enough comet to survive that. But smaller comets will just, sometimes make one pass and that's it. And then it all goes away because it gets heated up. Yeah. Um, and what, it, what yeah. is the star looking object on the left just inside the Kuiper belt? You mean this? Is that it, uh, Tina? I, I believe that's it. This is just, uh, I don't know exactly which star, but if I move, you won't see it anymore. Um, this is just part of the star field. So this is a background gotcha. star in our Milky Way. Um, and I'll just mention um, these stars again, this is exactly where they'd be in this time and place. Um, they are accurately placed into the data set. And fun fact, they were placed um, by Neil deGrasse Tyson when he first started working at the Hayden Planetarium. So this is part of this, all of these um, of the data I show you, a lot of it is part of um, a repository called the Digital Universe, which you can see in space programs that are presented at the American Museum of Natural History. And then the other data sets are from missions, ongoing missions that we have. So we have a lot of new data that I'll show you. That's a good question. So these, um, so these trails that I'm showing, this one here that I'm turning, that I turned on and off, and this one here, Borisov. So we have a Muamua and Borisov. These are really cool comets. And the reason is that um, we think they came from interstellar space. So most of the comets, like I told you in the beginning, came from our protoplanetary disk. They're the remnants of planet formation, but not Borisov and Oumuamua. This is um, Oumuamua. Uh, these came, you can, uh, astronomers can trace their paths all the way out to beyond the solar system. And that's how we know they're actually not from our solar system. They're from ice and, uh, and rock from outer space, from basically, I don't usually use the term outer space, but literally outside our solar system. And an interesting, uh, 
uh, actually a new uh, in the news recently was a an astrophysicist at Harvard named Avi Loeb uh, is postulating that this could be he thinks could we should be able to think about this as possibly um, a, uh, a a signal a signal from an extraterrestrial intelligent civilization and he is um, a little bit alone in this idea <laughs> of um, this being a sign of extraterrestrial intelligence but he thinks that um, the shape, the unusual shape and shininess of this object and how unusual it is compared to other comets and other rocks that we should open our minds to the possibility that it could be from extraterrestrials. Now, I just wanna emphasize this is not proof that it's from extraterrestrials and this is certainly not um, uh, embraced by the entire astrophysical community, but it is an idea out there. And there's um, an interesting article in the New York Times you can actually find from a few days ago about his book on this that just came out. Okay, so we have a Muamua. And, uh, and interesting thing also about comets, I'll just say, um, we'll turn this off. And so we have, again, we've got our comets out here. And um, another interesting comet is, uh, let's see, I'll just turn this one on, oops, uh, is Neowise. And I think, do I have an orbit? I'm not sure if I have an orbit of Neowise, but Neowise was a comet. This actually, I took this picture from our house uh, near Hillsboro, where Neowise came and, and uh, was glorious in our skies uh, a, a few months ago. And so you could actually see this comet with binoculars in a fairly dark sky. And um, we're fortunate to live in a really nice dark area. And so this is the uh, picture. So we can see uh, the tail of this comet. And that's exactly what happens to comets as they come close to the sun. And I'll mention too, when we talk about terrestrial planets and we talk about, I'm gonna show you some craters today and um, thinking about these objects actually coming and hitting planets. And they certainly have come to hit earth and they will continue to do that and hit other planets. And one interesting um, thing to think about is comets and asteroids delivering materials to Earth. So typically when we think of impacts, we think, well, that's bad. You don't wanna be hit by a meteor, a meteorite, a rock. You know, it's certainly not um, usually very, uh, a great thing to have happen if you're, you know, have some big rock crashing through the atmosphere and exploding. But um, actually these objects are filled with organic molecules and water, which you can see here. And it's thought that it's possible that comets and asteroids could deliver these materials to planets and possibly could have seeded life or at least the ingredients for life on Earth. And we, don't, we still don't know how Earth got its oceans and how Earth got um, materials for life, uh, but it's, poss it's certainly possible. And there are a lot of um, uh, well-supported theories out there that state that asteroids and comets are certainly uh, great repositories for these materials and could have survived in interstellar space. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a little while. This is a picture. For, yes. Is there a question? Uh, you go ahead and describe this picture and then I'll, I'll ask him. Okay. okay. So this is a picture of comet uh, Hartley 2. And this comet of uh, it's about 20, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, there was um, a telescope went by it and it was a Herschel Space Telescope and actually measured the composition of the water in this comet. And they looked at um, the type of hydrogen and we call these isotopes and looked at the type of, is it heavy hydrogen or light hydrogen and was able to find that the ratio of the heavy to light hydrogen was similar to what we have in our oceans. And so this led to the idea that comets certainly with a similar isotopic composition, at least for certain comets, like this Jupiter family comet, could have um, uh, certainly helped seed our oceans because of the similar composition of the water. Now, not all comets have these compositions, but a certain families of comets do, like Hartley II, and that's the Jupiter family comets, which I'm showing you here in, um, I'll just turn that on, in this these little green, green ones here. So I'm going to start zooming in. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so Hans wanted to know, um, did our sun capture these extra solar system objects as we move through space? Yeah, it's not really known. And um, I don't think the gravitational pull of the sun kind of ends. Uh, you know, we have the influence of the sun is called the heliopause. And that's actually well beyond the orbit of the Kuiper belt. And where the Voyager spacecrafts are now, that's, um, that is uh, the, what we call the heliopause, which is sort of the end of the, more or less the reach of the sun. However, there's also a big cloud of comets past that called the Oort cloud, but the sun can't 
pull from well beyond, you know, outer, well beyond that, uh, beyond the Oort cloud, because that's kind of the limit of the gravitational uh, uh, sphere or, or gravitational re, uh, um, diameter of the uh, of the sun. So how they got here, um, you know, it, it's probably random in how they uh, entered our, our solar system. And um, there's uh, a lot of stuff in space. Of course, there's a lot of space in space. So how they actually got here, um, I'm not sure if we actually know exactly, but it's not really the pull of the sun unless it's kind of in our solar system and then it could certainly come towards the sun. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers your question. Cool, yeah, thank you. Right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on the asteroids. So these are bodies that are closer. Oh, I forgot one thing, I'm sorry. Um, one thing more about the comets that I wanted to mention is to remember that they actually impact planets. And this is a comet uh, image from a comet Shoemaker-Levy uh, 2 from the 1990s as it's being pulled into Jupiter's gravitational hold. And so this comet was pulled apart. It's called a string of pearls. It looks a little bit like pearls on a string. And that's because Jupiter has pulled in this comet to its atmosphere because it's so big. And here you can see this is, um, these uh, spots on the, this is Jupiter, and these spots on Jupiter are where the, the comet is actually hitting the surface. And we can thank Jupiter for this uh, great job it's doing for um, sucking up all of the material that could potentially hit Earth. And so one thought is that we need a Jupiter-sized planet to protect a small planet like ours uh, from being completely obliterated or bombarded and have all this disruption, disruption to life. But certainly we still have asteroids that hit um, Earth, but not nearly as many as we would comets and asteroids if we didn't have Jupiter to help take up a lot of those, um, a lot of those rocks. So uh, I am going to go ahead and turn on the comets, uh, sorry, the asteroids. So we have a couple of options. We have all of these data sets, and again, and the long trails, this is just one of the objects that uh, has a longer orbit. Um, and these are the, when we think of the comets, we think of ice, and we think of the asteroids, we think of more rocky bodies because they're closer to the sun and the materials that make up the asteroids uh, can survive, that material uh, can survive being closer to the sun, whereas the ice will all come off these objects because of the heat of the sun. So in the inner asteroid belt, uh, these, are the, these are some of the asteroids I'm showing you. I'm not gonna turn on all the asteroids because there are so many, there are, hundred, there are hundreds of thousands in this data set. So I'm just gonna turn on a few so that we can actually fly around without crashing the program because I'm also online so that um, I wanna be able to tell you guys stuff. So we have the main asteroid belt and I'm going to turn that on for a second, but then I'm gonna turn it off. So you see, these are actually hundreds of thousands of asteroids that take up a lot of bandwidth. So I'm gonna turn those back off. But um, we have inner asteroids. We have, uh, there are hundreds of thousands, millions of asteroids really in our asteroid belt. And they're between Mars and Jupiter for the most part. And I'll turn on the um, Jupiter Trojans. These are really cool. These are the green ones that look like little uh, bunny ears or I guess little earmuffs you could say. Um, and these asteroids are placed this way because the orbit of Jupiter, it, because Jupiter is so massive that it clears out the asteroids that are near it. It just, they can't, they can't get close enough to Jupiter in, uh, to uh, sustain a stable orbit. So the ones that survive Jupiter's pull are kind of out here, kind of like avoiding Jupiter a little bit. And that's why we don't have a complete sphere of the Jupiter family comets, but we have, or a complete um, orbit, we have these spaces. And Jupiter family comets uh, are, uh, or sorry, Jupiter, the Trojans are, what am I here? The Trojans are interesting for other reasons. And that is that they are rich in um, metals and they're possibly regions we might think of mining if we can ever uh, get off this planet in any uh, sustainable way and maintain a presence on, uh, basically on some other body besides the space station. Um, so I think I have another picture of this. So this is an artistic rendering of what mining an asteroid might look um. like. Hey, Rachel, yeah. sorry. Do you okay. mind going back to that and, and showing us Jupiter's location in that? Oh, region? yeah, for sure. If that's easy to do. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I can just turn it on. Let me go down here. Ah. Jupiter. I'll turn on the label. Here we go. So you have a label. There's Jupiter. 
Cool, thank you. And you can see how Jupiter is just clearing out uh, its region. So these are called these are in what's called orbital resonance uh, for um, people who know about asteroids, and you can um, and they are locked in to this orbit of Jupiter. So either that or they get pulled into Jupiter's gravity. Yeah. So the Trojans here. We'll get a little closer. The Trojans are cool because we might be able to mine them someday. And this is a rendering of what an asteroid mine might look like. And so nickel or those kinds of um, heavy metals that we need and also rare metals could possibly be harvested from asteroids and used on Earth. Um, this is of course easier said than done, how to get on these asteroids safely, how to um, create this machinery to get over there. All of this is of course not um, fully worked out, but these are ideas of what um, of uh, possibilities. And so asteroids are certainly a big repository of materials that could be of use for humans. Okay, so here we are. So we're in the um, uh, Jupiter family. Uh, so we have these asteroids around Jupiter and then getting even closer, we have the asteroids in our inner belt. So these are again, getting closer to earth and I'll start zooming in. In fact, I'm focused on Mercury, so I'm gonna go back and focus on Earth, and I'm going to zoom in. And the inner asteroid belt is interesting in that um, we have, uh, when we have meteorites, and some of you may have been to the museum to see some of our meteorites or have seen other meteorites, most meteorites come from asteroids in our asteroid belt, right? And so a few come from Mars and a few come from the moon, but most of them just come from nameless asteroids, and we're not sure which ones. And that's um, with the exception of Mil Balili, which is an asteroid, uh, which is a, a meteorite, excuse me, from the asteroid Vesta. And Vesta is in the, um, in the main asteroid belt. And this is an image I took of, uh, we did, we're doing, um, I'm working on a CT project, computed, computed tomography, where we're basically taking X-ray images through these samples. And we have a sample of Mil Balili, um, that is, uh, that is from this exact asteroid. And that's what makes it kind of interesting is that um, we can see, uh, we can understand it, uh, a lot about the specific asteroid by the fact that we know this uh, meteorite comes from this particular type. And so this is one of the, one of the meteorites we have on loan from Don Klein um, in our meteorite collection. And we can, with these colors, we can emphasize different minerals inside the meteorites. And I'll be showing you another picture of uh, one other meteorite from this study in a, in a little while. But we can see fractures to get a meteorite to come off of an asteroid, it has to be smashed uh, somehow. And that happens with another asteroid colliding. Um, usually asteroids are very far apart. So you know, thousands of kilometers, millions of miles uh, far apart from each other, but there, is, there are collisions that happen or they can just be kicked out of orbit for some other reason. And um, then they come into our uh, vicinity of Earth. And I will turn on that. That may be the ones that interest people the most, which are the potentially hazardous asteroids that come to our planet. And, and Rachel, when that yeah. happens, how do we know that it's from that particular asteroid and not from you know, a different one that has a similar composition? Right, so we know because Milbaluli is, a, uh, sorry, uh, Vesta is a specific kind of asteroid. Um, it's called a Eucrite, and they, uh, uh, they well, the meteorite that comes from it is, is called a Eucrite. And they basi we basically have a lot, it's a very unusual type of asteroid, and we have a very specific spectroscopy from this asteroid. And so we were able to, uh, or meteoritists uh, several, many years ago, were able to exactly pinpoint this particular meteorite to this asteroid due to, the, because of the spectroscopy that we have on it. And so that's exactly how we know meteorites are also from Mars when they're from Mars and from the moon. Well, the moon we have, moon, we have lunar samples too from Apollo, but we also have spectroscopy from orbiters. Um, and so we are able to tell for this particular asteroid. I mean, it's a great question. Uh, most of the time we just have these sort of nameless, you know, general type of asteroids and we're not able to pinpoint it exactly. But for this one, we were, and Vesta is a pretty big asteroid too. Um, so we were able to tell uh, a lot of work has been done on it. Cool. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Uh, so for Earth, what I'm gonna do, one thing you can do with open space is you can manipulate uh, data sets, which is fun. And I am going to change the scale of Earth so you can see it. 
and I'm going to make it about 50 times bigger. And I am going to change, uh, let's do, let's go to it. So I've turned on the only data set you see are potentially hazardous asteroids. And these are the asteroids that sometime or other may, will cross into Earth's orbit and potentially collide. And that's how we know they are potentially hazardous. Now, we don't have a full data set for this. Um, I'm gonna turn up Earth and have it go about two, a little more than two days per second. So now you can see we're looking at, and I'll, I'll actually move over. I love what I love about open space is you can zoom around, you can you can get different perspectives. Jupiter's still on, making sure you know it's there. <laughs> you get different perspectives of the asteroid belt, and again, you know you're all you're still looking at all real data. And now we're looking at Earth spinning at about two days per second, and you can see how these asteroids are kind of you know crisscrossing a little bit. Um, we're still hundreds of thousands, if not millions of miles away from Earth, mostly millions of miles, hundreds of, not, that's actually not that far, but millions of miles away, but they still are pretty close and their orbits are such that they could potentially collide with Earth. And so this is where it gets interesting is, well, what does that mean? And, and certainly um, these uh, near Earth asteroids uh, do come in impact, do impact Earth. And we've seen evidence for this. Um, and let me see here really quick what my next image is, because I had, let's see. Okay, so one, I'm gonna come back to this one uh, in a second. Oops, sorry, that's for the earth. But I'll come back to the, uh, I was I was uh, looking for Chelly Banks, but that's later on in my talk. But um, for the near earth asteroids, the ones that collide could have produced, uh, could have seeded, as I was saying, uh, molecules on Earth that we need for life. And one line of evidence for this from this meteorite called Murchison is that it has amino acids inside it. And so that is, these are some of the um, various amino acids that are actually in Murchison. Some of these are only extraterrestrial, some are not. Um, but what it means is that uh, organic molecules and molecules that are we think of as delicate can actually survive space for millions of years, if not billions of years, and then come in and then come uh, and and uh, crash into Earth. And so this is another reason Murchison is a very important meteorite for under for astrobiology for studying the uh, impact of these molecules on Earth. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn off time here. I'm going to go to real time, and now we're back. And I'm going to leave the asteroids on, and I'm probably going to skip, um, I was gonna go to Mercury, I guess I could go pretty fast. The nice thing is you can go faster than the speed of light with open space. So maybe I'll do that really fast. And if someone has a question while I find Mercury, I'll have to Yeah, answer. yeah, um, so Ruja wanted to know, what is the difference between asteroids, meteorites, and comets? And follow up, which one has more metals? Yeah, good question. So asteroids uh, have the metals and meteorites are, meteorites are essentially the rocks when, they, when, a, when an asteroid breaks up and a piece of it comes crashing onto Earth <clears throat> and, it, and it basically explodes as it passes through the atmosphere, the pieces of rock that you pick up, those are the meteorites. And so when you think, so that's essentially the connection there. And when we look up and we see the light coming through, that's what we call a meteor. That's the light that comes through as the outer material of the asteroid or the piece of the asteroid is burning, is uh, melting. And you see that light coming through as it as it's a friction onto the atmosphere, friction with the molecules in the atmosphere. And a comet is essentially ice. A lot there's rock in comets too, but they're mostly ice, and they're in the outer part of the solar system, farther out, where ice can stay solid without um, without being heated by the sun. Mm -hmm. So awesome. that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Mercury. You're welcome. We're gonna fly to Mercury. So Mercury, I like Mercury, and I turned on a data set. That's kind of I was excited to show. I have to do one thing for you to see it, but this is all colored. <clears throat> you can see the craters really well, and that's why I like this data set. I'm just gonna quickly uh, do um, go to my data set. So you can, Messenger is a mission that went to Mercury uh, recently, and it, it was uh, deliberately crashed onto Mercury uh, when they ended the mission. Here, I'll turn on the multiplier. So now it's a little bit brighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cool colors here, cool as in temperature, Everything's cool that I'm showing you, obviously, but <laughs> but the temperatures are cool. These are uh, these are shallower than the warmer colors. So the uh, cooler colors are uh, basically basins, the green and the blue, and the warmer colors, the red, yellow, 
um, those are higher elevation. And so you can see here, we see lots of craters and everything's random really in space. And so we have just, a, you know, there are rocks flying around and, and objects get hit randomly essentially. But the fact that mercury has very, very little atmosphere um, and is basically no erosion means that it can preserve. It is a relic of billions of years in our solar system, a few, at least a few billion years when uh, there was a lot of impact on all the planets. And um, there are a few hundred craters on Mercury that have been documented. This is a really deep one here, all from the Messenger mission. And there, <clears throat> there are hundreds of thousands on the moon, which you will we'll go to as well as we um, go towards Mars. But on Earth, we only have about 128. And that's because we have an atmosphere that burns up a lot of the asteroids or the pieces that come in. And also we have erosion and plate tectonics that mix everything back up together. So we don't have a lot of these relics. But these other planets, this terrestrial planet, the closest to the sun, which is basically a, a ball of iron, more or less, <clears throat> is, um, is a relic of one of our relics of this um, era of bombardment in our solar system. So that's why I really, and I love this mission. I love this data set. And you can turn on all these data sets. And again, the colors, this is false color in that it represents elevation and not actually mm -hmm. the colors you might see with your eyes. So let's go to Earth. Uh, we can't do this without going to our planet. And uh, the first place I'll go is Meteor Crater, which is one of the best preserved craters. <clears throat> I'm gonna leave on the near Earth asteroids just for fun. This is one of the best preserved craters that we have on Earth. Um, it's fairly small and it, it actually um, is from, um, it, it is from a meteor that impacted about 50,000 years ago. Wow. And I'm gonna go to, I hope I didn't, yeah, good. Sometimes I click Mauna Kea and then we end up in Hawaii, which isn't a bad thing really, but um, right. for the purposes of Meteor Crater, it's <laughs> not where we wanna be. This is in Arizona. And so Meteor Crater is actually fairly close to the Grand Canyon. Um, and as you get close, you can see the Grand Canyon that's right here. And one thing about open space that's great is um, you can travel all over and see these amazing data sets. Uh, and you can go down into the Grand Canyon um, and fly around. And all of the data, again, is from satellites that are orbiting the Earth all the time. Um, and so we get these data sets that are pulled into a server into open space. And so it's not real time, but it's fairly recent. So they're probably, they could even be a few days old. So as you can see, and if you, if you tilt Earth a little bit, you can see all these great asteroids and you can fly here. And as we drive over to Meteor Crater, which I put a little balloon over, so I find it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can see you can see the beautiful um, the beautiful Grand Canyon. So Meteor Crater, I don't know if any of you have been there, but um, it's a really cool crater. It's um, it really showcases all the things we think about in terms of craters. And now that we're here, I can turn my bubble off. I feel you know crazy. Like I didn't even know that this existed. I mean, Meteor Crater. Yeah, Meteor Crater. Oh yeah, it's yeah, a great, it there's, a, there's a visitor center. Very cool. We have Geologist. some people yeah. who have been there. Oh good, awesome. So it may look familiar. There's the highway. Astrobiologists are, you know, they think they're really funny. They say, oh, it's great that the crater, that the meteor came near the visitor center, near the highway, make it funny. <laughs> Which of course we weren't there. So what was there? Well, this is where my sloths came in. So 50,000 years ago, when the Colorado Plateau was warmer and wetter, there were these really cute giant sloths. And one of my favorites, the woolly mammoth, which is not around anymore, of course. But these were the animals that would have seen this impact. And it's, you know, a crater this size, it was, it was a few, about a, um, three miles around, is uh, it, this wouldn't be a devastating impact. I mean, it's certainly a this mammoth was standing right there, it probably wouldn't have had a good day, but it wouldn't have been, it's not devastating to a whole entire species or group of animals, which, which we'll talk about in a second. But this, uh, this impact happened, you'd get all of this. You, there are still meteorites found around Meteor Crater, and, it, and we have some samples here in the museum. It's a very well-studied uh, well studied asteroid. It's basically an iron that exploded above the, right above. Um, and made this crater. 
They trained the Apollo astronauts inside this crater. So that's pretty cool. Um, when the Apollo astronauts were getting ready to go to the moon, <clears throat> they wanted them to be able to differentiate volcanic craters from impact craters on the moon. And so Meteor Crater was one of the sites for training the astronauts to actually go to the moon before the first mission to the moon. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead. Real quick, Hans wanted to know how far from the crater has ejecta been found? So like, you know. Oh yeah, that's a good question. I don't have the exact number. Um, I suspect a few, mi a, a few miles. I mean, it can actually go really far and there's an exact number. I'd have to look it up, but it's a, it can, the ejecta blanket skews out yeah. pretty far so it can be a ways I don't know if there's any left to find though and did you, did you say the meteor was about three miles <sighs> it's about three no miles? the meteor would have been about um would have been less so the, the the crater is about 10 times greater than the diameter of the asteroid and uh, so um it would have been about uh 10 times smaller than we see here okay um but I see I'm running a little bit slow on time so the less I'm gonna skip one place but I'm gonna take you to uh, Chicxulub, which is a famous crater, some of you may have heard. And to get there, we have to go through the earth. Why don't we do that? Ooh. Open space is fun. So this is Chicxulub. This is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And I'm going to turn it because I have an image to go with this. And while I'm here, now I have to turn, I'm going to turn, make it daylight in the Yucatan. So this is near Mexico. Come on, wake up. There we go. Okay, so Chicxulub, this is a crater that's actually underwater. And um, this impact happened 65 million years ago. And this is famous, of course, for the demise of the dinosaurs. Um, and I'll turn on my image of that. So you can see the outline. This is the, I'll turn it off and on. So this is the outline here. This is the, um, you, the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And this is, uh, this is in Spanish, it's a Mexican um, uh, data source. Uh, and so, but this is the, eject, the ejective blanket went out all the way out here. So most of the research is underwater um, to discover when they discovered the Chicxulub crater. And so 65 million years ago, this impact was devastating and it devastated the dinosaurs um, and led to, you know, they were probably still already on the decline, but it led to the emergence of mammals. Um, so we were about the size, mammals were about the size of little shrews. And um, with the demise of the dinosaurs, this enabled mammals to evolve into what we are today. And so that's um, the very famous impact. And, um, and so this crater is well studied and uh, there are several mass extinctions that could have been caused by asteroids. And this is probably the most famous one, but certainly not the only mass extinction um, on earth. There are about five mass extinctions, not including the one that many uh, scientists think we're in now. Uh, due to humans, um, but that's not the subject of this talk, but it's something to think about in terms of mass extinctions. Um, and so I'm not gonna uh, stop at a lake. I was going to stop, but I kind of want to get to Mars. Um, and I'll probably, in the interest of time, just go to Mars at this point. I was gonna take go to the moon, but honestly, the moon, uh, you've all seen a lot of the moon probably during this astronomy days. And the moon is again, a relic, just like, Mars is, and I'm going to go to, I'm going to, I'm going to take us to Jezero Crater, but I'm actually um, going to fly, uh, we're going to fly to Mars with open space is so much fun because again, we get there and what was that, two seconds? Yeah, so, and while you're yeah. traveling there, um, do you happen to know if, if people who are not research scientists, can they dive underwater to look at Chicxulub Crater? Oh, that's a great question. I would say you have to be a diver. Um, I don't know how deep the crater is. It's probably, I, I, would, I think it looks like it's right on the edge of the peninsula, but I don't know how deep that shelf is. So that's a good question to find out. You certainly would have to be a diver, so a certified diver. Um, and it could be quite deep that you wouldn't be able to dive down to the depth necessary to study it. Um, so that, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but I thought I saw, I, if I'm not mistaken, there are places you can go. There, it's a if there are shore dives, possibly, because it's on the shoreline, right? You saw that the, mm -hmm. the uh, circumference goes beyond the shore. So. Um, so this little bubble. So this is Mars, right? So we have our beautiful Mars. Everybody is interested in Mars. Um, and Mars is um, also got several, it has, uh, has many craters, has many more craters than Earth. Because again, Mars has lost its atmosphere. 
And so that atmosphere protects us from many impacts. And um, oh, the reason I can't travel is because I am stuck on Jezero. So hold on. Uh, there we go. All right. So now I can take you a little bit. All right. So we zoom out. And actually, what I'm going to do, just like we have um, near Earth asteroids and these um, potentially hazardous, we also have Mars crossing asteroids. And what's cool about Mars, and I'm going to, and did I turn off? I think I turned off the potentially hazardous, right? So all these red lines you're seeing now are Mars crossing asteroids. And so these are just like Earth. There are asteroids that are fairly close and within the orbit, orbital trajectory of Mars. So they should cross at some point. That's the prediction. Um, and it looks like there's a lot of them. And it may worry some people, wow, that's a lot of asteroids and we have a lot of asteroids. But one thing to know, and, act, and I meant to show this, which I probably, is remember this, is that this is the plot showing the size of an impactor and the time in years. So this holds for any planet really. So Mars, Earth, except I am showing you um, a, a different meteor here, is that a KT, bound, KT meteor, this is the dinosaur extinction. A Chelyabinsk was a hit that happened over Russia um, in 2013. So the chances of being hit by a devastating mass extinction type of impact, or even a tsunami, that goes down uh, quite, it goes to, it's a direct, indirect relationship with time. So that means that it will take, um, there are many more years, eons between these giant impactors. And we get about 50 tons of asteroid material a day, per day that come through earth, but they're mostly particles. And so we get, in, we have little tiny, tiny, teeny impacts down on this end all the time on Earth. But as you get larger, that time uh, difference goes down. So basically, that means that every 100 million years, you would get something like the dinosaur extinction. So you might think, well, 65 million years ago, we're getting towards 100 million years, and you'd be correct. Um, so we don't know when the next huge impact will happen, but maybe by the time it comes, we'll have some technology to deflect it in some way. So this is, we do get hit by impacts, we still do. This was the Chelyabinsk meteor and we have, um, well, I'll just pause a second because I was gonna go to the moon too, is I was, I'll just show you is that we have um, pieces of these asteroids, uh, pieces of these impactors, even at the museum that we're studying. And, um, and this is the meteor that came through over Russia and the little piece we have, I actually got this in Russia a few years ago when I was there, I was able to get um, kind of a, a directly from the source um, you can see the, the crust that forms. This is a melted crust as the meteor is coming through the atmosphere. You can actually see the parts that are burned up or melted on the surface. And we call this a fusion crust. And again, I did a little, I did a CT of it. And you can see that in blue, I use a color palette that showcases the crust in the CT scan. And the white is metal and the um, other colors would be more rocket. So you have this blue crust here. And I will just say, um, that this is a meteorite, a new meteorite that I got uh, for the museum last year. This is from the moon. And this is um, from, was found in Northwest Africa in 2017. And it's fairly small. It looks big because I made it huge on, <laughs> in, on my screen, but it's, it's a fairly small meteorite. And um, we'll have it on display next to our Apollo sample at the museum in March. And so by the, uh, hopefully by the middle of March, we'll have a display showing this meteorite, which again, came off the moon somewhere on the moon. We don't know exactly where, but we can, we know it's from the moon by studying the composition, comparing it to Apollo samples. And, um, and we have a little piece of Apollo two from the moon. So we have a little exhibit coming up at the museum about the moon. Okay, so again about the moon, and I know we're not on the moon, but that's okay. Um, we may get to the moon someday and set up a base. And so it's again, something to think about is that humans are trying to get beyond earth still, and we haven't gotten very far uh, since the Apollo missions. And so, um, and so we're, you know, developing that technology is really important. Okay. Um, so I think, okay, so now we're just going to go, let's go down to this region. So we're talking about impact craters today. And where I'm taking you here in this balloon that I put up is Jezero Crater. And this is where Mars uh, Perseverance is going to land in, uh, in February, February 18th. And uh, we have actually, and I'm gonna make sure my data sets are turned on. We have uh, a program that day uh, centered around this landing. So please uh, tune in for that. Um, I know the program committee is probably 
Glennon. Yeah, we, we'll have a program on, on February 18th. I believe it's going to be at 1 p.m., although the landing is a little bit later that day, that afternoon. Right. Um, but they're going to email all of the Astronomy Days registrants with a link to that program. Oh, good. So, Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm showing you here, and we'll probably stop, uh, we'll, we'll tour around Jezero a little bit, and then I'll take more questions. <clears throat> so Jezero, and here you can see, I'll turn off my bubble. So we're not distracted um, by that. So yeah. Elise wanted to know, how do planets lose their atmosphere? Yeah, so that's that's been studied uh, for Mars, and it's a great. Uh, it, it's really important for us to understand this for Earth too, and especially except we're going in a different direction on Earth with um, increasing our atmosphere in not such a good way. But um, for Mars, it's thought to be the reason is that uh, the sun, the impact of solar wind, has essentially sputtered off the particles that are in the upper atmosphere of Mars. And then as those left, then more of the atmosphere was sputtered off. So it's essentially due to the solar wind uh, on Mars that caused, uh, that caused the atmosphere to disappear. And th another reason Mars started to lose its atmosphere is that it, it, lost, um, it, it lost a lot of its magnetic, uh, it, it doesn't have plate tectonics, I mean to say, so it doesn't, it lost its um, ability to uh, recycle uh, molecules into its atmosphere. And so it, has no plate tectonics, uh, or at least not to the extent it would need to hold on to an atmosphere. Its magnetic field is much weaker, so it doesn't have this magnetic field to hold on to an atmosphere like we do on Earth, kind of like a force field to hold on to our atmosphere. And, um, and so the solar wind can sputter off this entire atmosphere. It has a thin atmosphere, it's not all gone. You can see actually in open space a little bit of that. And without an atmosphere, it can't hold on to liquid water. So that's why, Mars is a fascinating planet because we know it had liquid water sometime in its past, and we can see remnants of this uh, with this crater. And I'm actually going to quickly, because I don't want to get lost, I'm going to go back because I went a little too far. Um, Mars uh, did have um, did have water in its past, and you can and there are plenty of lines of evidence for this. We can see this by the shorelines here. These uh, ridges that are evidence we see, um, we see this in outflow channels. So you can see here that there are outflow channels in Mars um, and there are many other regions of Mars that show that there was liquid water in the past. And I'm actually gonna get to the shoreline if I can find it. Oh, I know why, because I'm still not, <laughs> it didn't go to it, hold on a sec. All right, now we're, now we're talking. All right, so this is where I meant to go. And unfortunately with open space, you have to, well, it's not unfortunate, it's just, let's see, hold on. Uh, so the reason Jezero is going to land, uh, sorry, the reason that Mars 2020 is going to land in Jezero is because there's a shoreline here. And I'm gonna turn it, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so Jezero is going to land, I keep saying this, this is Jezero Crater and it's a, it's a crater within a crater. So double impact made this crater, which then filled up with water some time in Mars's past. And we know this because we see there's an outflow channel and as the data load, you'll see this, there's a whole outflow channel and a delta that fans out here. This was a region of water in, um, in Mars's past. And so um, there's an analog lake, <clears throat> which I didn't have time to go to today, called Lake Salda in Turkey. And you can look it up, it's, it's uh, really interesting and it has these really interesting biocarbonate features along this a similar shoreline here. And so scientists are hoping that maybe there's evidence, not only evidence of past water, but maybe they'll see some kind of evidence perhaps of um, at least uh, more chemical uh, interactions with water and maybe even fossil life if we ever find, and that would certainly be a groundbreaking discovery. But, um, if you come back on the 18th, I'll present, I'll present uh, another tour of Jezero and we'll talk about it further. But essentially it's one of these really exciting regions of Mars that because of the impact on Mars, filled with water and then with water, we think, well, there's a possibility for life because all life as we know it needs water. And um, that's where we look. Um, and so the only, right now that's our focus. So are there any questions about that? Is, that? Go ahead. That was Citing the potential of finding, uh, you know, fossil evidence of life. Um, so Hans wanted to know the question, how do you know it's a meteorite just by looking at it and not a terrestrial rock? 
and how would how would we know if we find one? Yeah, it's a good question. So usually you can tell by looking at them that they're not meteorites. Uh, most of the time they're not meteorites. Unfortunately, it is pretty rare to find one. But if it, uh, and you can tell by looking at the uh, surface uh, often, and you can tell uh, if, if it's not, if it's definitely not a meteorite, it's usually pretty obvious from a picture. Um, and then beyond that, if it looks potentially like a meteorite, then you actually do have to analyze it uh, with uh, either by looking at, you know, looking at it with your hands, of course, first, but then um, you can do isotopic analysis, you can do chemical analysis, you can analyze it with um, various uh, mass spectroscopy to then know for sure that it's a meteorite. Uh, most meteorite types have been, you know, they're, they're very uh, well studied. And so usually by the time you get to that point of chemical analysis, it's known that you have a meteorite. But if you pick up a rock that you think might be a meteorite, you can always send it to uh, scientists like me. You can send an email with pictures and we can look at it. Um, and then uh, I have rarely, I think one time someone actually brought a piece of a real meteorite that was very clearly a meteorite, but um, usually it, it isn't. And even with a magnet, you can't tell that it's a meteorite because um, uh, earth has iron too. So earth attracts a magnet as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this will be our last question before we go. Do we know if we have meteorites from places other than um, from other planets other than Mars? No, we do not have any evidence for meteorites from other planets. Um, it takes a lot to pick off a rock from a planet. Um, you have Jupiter still there, by the way, really wants us to make sure we remember <laughs> its existence. Um, so, so, um, no, we have no evidence uh, that uh, any meteorites come from another planet. Um, it's certainly possible, but again, it would take, uh, it, it takes a lot, you have to, it's something that has to smash into that planet to kick off a meteorite uh, that will eventually become a meteorite if it lands on Earth. So Mars um, has had that happen and it's close enough to us that we get these impacts. The only um, other possibilities for a meteorite from another planet uh, would, be Mar would be Venus and Mercury. And uh, those would be very difficult to get here. Venus has an enormously thick atmosphere full of sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide. So getting anything off the surface uh, to travel to Earth would be very, very difficult to do. Um, and Mercury is very far away. And so traveling again to Earth would be, uh, would be hard. And so right now it's not impossible, but right now there is nothing, no piece of evidence for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing your expertise. Thank you. I hope I answered all the questions. Yeah, yeah. I think um, if y'all have any other questions, you know, you can find our, our email addresses on the museum website. You can contact us. If you think you found a meteorite, you can submit it to our Ask a Naturalist form, um, which I put a link um, to in the chat a few minutes ago. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. So in the museum, certainly we have people here, uh, right? You can email me or you can do the mm -hmm. Ask a Naturalist. They, yeah, because Dr. Smith helps with those identifications yeah. as well. And we also put a link to a survey um, from Open Space. So if you can please take that survey after watching this program, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and we also just want to say, you know, thank you for watching. Thank you to the NC Space Grant for supporting Astronomy Days. And thank you to our friends of the museum members who support us every single day. Don't forget, you can grab a hoodie or a t-shirt from our website. Friends members get 10% off. And we've got a few more programs today. So don't stop with the astronomy stuff yet. <laughs> um, check out the website for more programs. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.